Hello and welcome back to the Retro Workshop. I recently bought this JVC monitor for use with my collection of computers. Unfortunately, when the monitor arrived, I had a few scratches on the screen. Now, I've learnt there's a fix, so join me as I make the repair and test the monitor out on some of my collection of retro computers. I've been keeping my eye out for this model for some time as it's one of the last broadcast spec CRT monitors produced. It was discontinued around 2010. It has great specifications, 17 inch screen size, a flat tube face with an aperture grill. This is a Sony Trinitron type technology which benefits from a brighter picture. It has 800 TV lines of horizontal resolution. It can be used as a 4x3 display or using a clip-on plastic bezel as a widescreen monitor. There are slots for three video interfaces. This monitor came with an SDI and HD SDI card suitable for broadcast video, but not much use for me here at home. So I bought a third party RGB and component card from eBay for around £80 including import duty. To fit it you just remove a blanking panel and slot in the card. This monitor originally sold for around £1400 in the UK without any video interfaces. I paid £200 for this monitor from an auction site. It's worth mentioning that CRT monitors are notoriously difficult to record. The pattern on the tube face interacts with the filter in the camera and you get moiré patterns depending on the zoom angle. And so for a quick test, and I've prepared a DVD with some test patterns. From this grid pattern I can see that the geometry and convergence looks good. Pressing the underscan button the size changes to show the entire picture. Normal TVs are set to chop off or overscan some of the image. Red, green and blue fields show that the colour purity is spot on. And grey fields show that the contrast is uniform, except for areas with damage to that anti-reflective coating. This would also show up any screen burn, which can be a big problem on CRT monitors. Finally, the familiar BBC Test Card F allows us to check a number of features. The squares allow us to check linearity, a circle checks aspect ratio, and the girl in the middle represents a real image and allows skin tones to be assessed. However, the test card I downloaded from the internet was a dodgy JPEG, so I knocked up my own which had better skin tones. There are many more features of test card F and there's a link down below if you want the full details. This monitor has an hours meter and this one's done about 7,000 hours, which is about 290 days of constant use. This isn't too bad, I'd expect a broadcast monitor to be good for many years of operation. Cosmetically the monitor's in fair condition. There are some scratches on the top of the case, one on the front bezel, and the usual remnants of sticky labels. With the monitor turned off you can clearly see the damage to the anti-reflective coating. However, the scratches where the widescreen bezel originally sat are more of a problem. Luckily an internet chat room user pointed out that this monitor has a removable film on the screen. This means tearing down the monitor to remove it, but this gives me the opportunity to check out the condition of the electronics. Ok, before I go inside it's worth noting the warning sign on the case. There are electric shock hazards and other dangers which I'll mention as the job progresses. Once the top cover is removed I can see that the monitor is quite clean inside with just a small amount of dust. The first hazard is the tube, which can retain a high voltage even after the monitor has been unplugged. You need to short the EHT anode to ground, for example using a screwdriver and a lead connected to the metalwork on the outside of the tube. You'll hear a crack if there's been a discharge, but you don't get one every time. On this monitor all the connectors are different, so you can't really get them in the wrong socket when reassembling, but it's worth making a note. Before I take the CRT out from the bezel, I've put on a face mask. It's good practice to use goggles and gloves when handling a tube. If you drop a bare tube, it could implode and throw glass everywhere. If you knock the thin glass near the tube base, it's unlikely to implode, but if you hear a rush of air, you've just destroyed the vacuum and the tube is useless. To prop the tube safely up, I've utilised this dog bed. Now my dog Frank keeps me company here in the workshop whilst I'm filming. Obviously he's not here now. It's a little bit smelly this dog bed unfortunately, but I'll do for this purpose. Anyway, we're taking great care not to bang 
the end of the tube, carefully lift the tube up and rest it into the dog bed or other suitable apparatus. So I can see that that's not going to go forward and it's not going to go backwards and it's not touching the glass envelope or knocking any of these delicate little magnets that sit on the back of the tube. And finally, I can peel off the damaged film from the face of the CRT. With the monitor partially reassembled, Frank's got his bed back, but he won't be resting for long as I've got the vacuum cleaner out to give the monitor a quick clean before I reassemble it. I then used a spray duster on the circuit boards. OK, so like any CRT monitor, we've got a whole heap of electrolytic capacitors, both these small surface mount caps here on the control board and lower down full size electrolytics on the main power and scan boards. Now, I'm not too concerned about the state of the caps because we've already seen that the geometry on this monitor is pretty good, which suggests that the caps are OK. However, once again, whilst we've got the thing in pieces, there's an opportunity to test them out with my ESR meter. Firstly, the surface mount caps on the signal PCB. And the large value caps check out OK. The smaller one and two microfarad caps show compare on the ESR meter. I don't think they're bad as you don't get great readings from small value caps, but I'll order up some replacements and change them at a later date. Moving on to the main PCB, another word of caution. Like the tube, capacitors can retain charge after the power has been removed. Large voltage capacitors, for example this 400 volt cap in the power supply, present a hazard. I first check the voltage using a multimeter. As you can see there's only about 14 volts, which isn't a hazard to health. However, charge capacitors can damage the ESR meter, so they should be discharged by shorting out the terminals. The capacitors I'm most interested in checking are those in the horizontal and vertical scanning circuits. These can suffer high ripple currents. Also those of a smaller physical size which are more likely to dry out, especially if they're near a heat sink, and there are plenty of those in this monitor. Firstly I check the vertical scan circuit, and then the horizontal scan circuit. And they're all in good shape. If you do change caps you need to be sure to get suitable types due to the high frequencies and ripple currents in these circuits. With the health check complete the monitor can be reassembled, paying attention to make all connections, particularly any earth straps. Here we can see the EHT anode going back into the tube. Many years ago I forgot to replace an EHT anode after a repair. When the monitor was plugged in it made for great excitement in the workshop as it arced against the metal case. The screen now looks much lighter in colour without the filter. Before we test it out time for a quick clean up. Firstly removing these bits from the missing widescreen bezel with a screwdriver. There was some glue around the JVC badge which I removed with IPA. The sticky residue on the top didn't come off so easily. I've got some label remover spray which works well if left to soak for a few minutes, and this did the job. And finally a good wipe over with a cloth and some mild detergent spray. With the monitor powered back up we can see the pictures vastly improved, the marks have gone, um, but there is one slight problem you can see from the filter which I've removed. Not only is it providing an anti-reflective coating, it's also acting a bit like a neutral density filter and without this in place some of the blacks do look a bit lifted up, they look a bit grey. Now this isn't a problem if you use it in a darkened room, as you can see from these pictures with the main lights turned off. It's quite usable and the blacks are black. And we can see that with the grey field displayed we no longer have a blotchy image. And now for the important test, how does the monitor look with my retro computers? First up on the Amiga where most of the games and desktop use a progressive scan image. I always like to test monitors with R-Type as it's great conversions on many systems and it's a game I remember playing years ago. 
The image is nice and stable with no flicker, and the scan lines are distinct and crisp. Rainbow Islands has large areas of saturated colour, and the image is bright and punchy. Rick Dangerous also shows off the monitor well. You can see from the backgrounds that these graphics were designed with CRT displays in mind. In Workbench we get a nice crisp desktop, and all the icons and text are clear, with no flicker. Firing up Deluxe Paint 3, Tutankhamun is still looking resplendent after all these years. On the BBC Micro, most games run in an interlaced video mode, so there's a little bit of flicker discernible. However, Chucky Egg still looks amazing, and it's probably my favourite game of all time. In modes other than Mode 7, you can switch to non-interlaced scan, and this demonstrates that you can reduce flicker and enhance the scanline definition. Plugging up my Atari ST, we suffer the usual hefty border around the screen. This monitor allows you to adjust the horizontal and vertical image size so you get more CRT for your money. But you've got to delve into the service menu for full control which allows you to totally eliminate the borders. And once again pictures look great. Some machines don't have RGB connectors and offer at best a composite output. There was a composite interface card in the brochure for this monitor, but I've never seen one for sale. I've got an Extron video scaler which has a composite input, and RGB output with horizontal and vertical syncs. By cycling through the resolutions on the scaler you can see that it works with some PC resolutions, such as 640x480 and 800x600. Of most interest to me is the 576p mode for use with the Spectrum. This high resolution monitor shows up some of the limitations of the composite signal, with shimmering on coloured details. Although it makes the monitor usable with composite sources, you'd actually be better off with an old TV with a composite video input. OK, so overall I'm very impressed with this JVC monitor. I was a little bit disappointed when it arrived as it came in a bit of a scruffy condition. It certainly wasn't the monitor shown in the photographs on the auction site. But you take a bit of a chance with these sort of websites and buying sight unseen. Electronically it's in great condition and the tube is in fine fettle. OK, so with the screen filter removed my monitor does rely on being in a darkened room for the best effect, but I can cope with that. Anyway, if you're in the market for a great CRT monitor I'd definitely recommend this JVC. Just make sure you can see it in person before buying and check out the state of the screen. Well, that's it for this video. If you enjoyed it, please do give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. Bye for now.